Wave. Hey, Jenny. Hey, hey Amanda. <laughs> Funny to see you here. Oh. <laughs> it was great being here. <laughs> um, so we have we have a lot to cover today. We have so you run the show of social media at MIT, but you're also a former journalist and TV anchor, and we also have some whiskey tasting to do in a little bit. So yes, we do. you got to just get to it. Okay. Um, all right. So I'm going to go ahead and introduce my esteemed guest today. So today, <laughs> everyone, uh, this is my good friend, Jenny Lee Fowler. She runs social media over at MIT. And I don't know what it's like to run a social account or a series of social accounts for the higher ed space. So we're going to talk about that. And Jenny's also a former TV anchor, which I'm excited to dig into. So without further ado, welcome, Jenny. Hi, the thanks, menu. Amanda. Thank you. <laughs> and I have to say, you know, I am a huge, huge, huge fan of yours. So thank you so much for inviting me yeah. on the show. Um, but yeah, no, I used to be uh, a, a reporter, a TV reporter and an anchor um, in a medium-sized market. It wasn't a large market. It was a mid-sized market. And so a lot of the anchors in medium-sized markets also produce their own shows. So, you know, I what that entailed is like, just a lot like what I did. I was like reading, knowing what's going on. And, you know, we didn't really have Twitter then. So back then it was really the newspaper and the AP wire. <laughs> that was mm -hmm. kind of the AP uh, wire. I haven't yeah. heard that in such a I long know. time. <laughs> I mean, it's the AP wire. It's listening to the um, scanners. It's really like multitasking and you're taking in all of this information and you're making decisions on what's my most important story of the day. You know, what's going to fall, like, what are the orders of my stories? Like, um, um, and I don't know if I don't know if any of your viewers actually watch like like, like local news now, <laughs> watch TV news. But you know when you um, have anchors, there's usually like a graphic box, and there's like an image that goes that coincides with mm -hmm. what they're talking about. Well, I put the requests, like we have a graphic um, design team and I would put the requests for what I want that graphic image to be. So if you think about now, like, you know, if I write social posts, I'm also working with a designer on what the image might look like or what we might have. So it's, I feel like a lot of this, you know, a lot of the stuff I did then translates, right? And so it's a lot of writing, you know, I wrote teases, I wrote, um, you know, um, stories in uh, short form, broadcast style right um and so that's a lot of what i what i do now um but it's it's really storytelling too i i, I think you know storytelling is everything i think storytelling is mm -hmm. in what, what everyone does um so yeah. It, yeah so i i would say that i a lot of those skills that i learned while i was a report you know <laughs> a tv reporter tv anchor i still utilize you know today for sure interesting um so my so my journalism background was in print slash online journalism. I say print slash online because it's typed out, but it was I worked for some digital media and tech blogs. And, you know, so the formats for which you create content for like a newspaper versus a blog versus a TV news show are all very different. Um, so the thing I'm curious about, if you could speak to this, is mm -hmm. as you were producing your own segments for TV, were there any sorts of like outlines or frameworks that you kind of stuck to that helped you produce, um, like flesh out the content for your segments? I mean, there, it's so, you know, you always do, there's news, there's weather, there's sports, right? Mm -hmm. um, but the news, you always, there's always a lead. Sometimes there's an obvious lead, right? And then sometimes it's a lead that that's where I think you have to kind of think about um, what would be the most important thing for my community today? And, you know, and how do I frame this and how do I um, flesh that out a little bit? I, I do think, you know, broadcast writing is really, really different from like advertising writing or, um, you know, print journalism for sure. Because, you know, like a broadcast journal, like story, a TV story could literally be like four sentences long is is how um, it, it seems long because the anchor is reading them. But if you see it on paper, it's really short. So you have to be really, really selective with the words that you're using, you know, which is sort of like most of our social media platforms today. Um, so you have to be really select and you have you have the lead, which since I've learned to call it a hook, right? I learned that from you in um, with your advice and your web 
webinars, but it's like your hook. And then, you know, you've got, you know, maybe the three things you want your um, audience to know from that story. And then you have like your summary or how you wrap it up. So it's really, really quick. Um, and then, and then you have to sort of segue to the next story. You have to make it all flow as well. So um, mm. not sure if I answered your question, but yeah, yeah. no, that, that, okay. that, but I would, but as you were talking, I was remembering some, I mean, I, I was not, I was definitely not a TV anchor, but I think from, from what I remember from, from college, just from some of the media classes that I took, that there's like certain language or certain terminologies that you that you should that you should use or stay away from as a TV anchor because from my understanding, you have to be mindful of things like if the feed cuts out, like I maybe mean, there are certain words that you would stay away from in case there's ambiguity <laughs> for whatever reason. So to, to help avoid some of that. Yeah. Is no, it, it, yes. It, it, <laughs> okay. it, it is. And, and there are even some words where, um, gosh, I wish, you know, I don't do this in my day to day anymore, but there were some words that like, even um, there are phrasings where you wouldn't want to put two words together because like um, the, the way the consonants, the ending consonants, the I mean, this is getting really down into the mm -hmm. weeds, but yes. Yes, that does yeah. exist. Um, and I bet there are more today than there used to be. Um, but yeah, that is that is something to consider when you're doing TV, for sure. Yeah. Uh, let's talk about a couple of like, I don't know, if there are any super tactical best practices or, or tactics that people can take from kind of TV anchor life to marketing or social media. Um, curious to know if there are any like specific uh, tricks or, or things that you've done that apply today or that you'd recommend to others as they be mindful of these things? Yeah, I, I just think like, you know, writing a lead is always, I mean, always helpful, I think, in no matter what industry that you're in. And it's funny, because when I first um, when I first started, I tried so hard to make these like really flowery leads, mm -hmm. <laughs> like, like that were um, that were interesting or that, that I thought were so creative. And then I just learned like, just say the thing. <laughs> like, don't, uh -huh. don't make it an interest. Like, don't make it hard to know what you're talking about or too creative that it's like esoteric. Like in your lead, it, you should just get into it you know, and say what you're trying mm -hmm. to say and then and then get into the rest of the story. So I think that's something that resonates. Um, and I think also in broadcast journalism, I could have like a perfectly um, scripted, per, you know, perfectly produced TV like show, half an hour, a new show. And then 20 minutes before, like uh, we're supposed to go on, like a tornado will hit. So that, mm -hmm. so like just always being able to, to adapt and not being so married to what you do to be able to, um, you know, pivot and really think of moving forward without feeling too sorry for yourself that you did all that work and it's coming. Yeah. You know, it's always, I think it's always good to be able to sort of pivot, but I think those are two big things that like anyone can sort of take with them. And mm -hmm. I think it's good to strike the balance between, you know, the whole, tell someone what you're going to say, say the thing, and then tell them what you said, like that versus just getting to the point, right? Because I think, yes, it's important to to explain like what value you're about to give or what information you're about to give, but to not spend too much time setting up that context because ultimately I think people um, just want to hear the thing. <laughs> no, exa exactly. And the, um, and also like in broadcast journalism, like most of this or broadcast TV, most of the stories that you're hearing are less than 30 seconds. They're 15 seconds to 30 seconds. And so now I, I, I think in terms of characters, but it really kind of translates, right? You have to really keep yeah. it. You, you only have so much time to really have your audience get at least one important. If you put three, you're lucky if they stay, if one point or one mm -hmm. um, bit of information stays with them, right? So you have a very short amount of time to maybe hopefully hope like one thing sticks. Um, yeah. And that, yeah, that still yeah. is what I do today, right? Yeah. Right, yeah, that's a good point. Um, yeah, especially if you, I mean, that's part of what I really like about Twitter is that because of the 280 character count constraint, mm -hmm. it is every tweet is an exercise in communicating effectively, efficiently, quickly. 
Totally. You have to make yeah. every word count, right? Yeah. Like, like Yoda, every word <laughs> has to count. <laughs> uh, so the, so last thing here before we move on to our segment. Uh, so I'm curious about what it's like to, to run social media for the higher ed uh, space. So, you know, you run, for, you run social media for MIT. Um, what are some of the key differences between running a social media account in the education space versus for a regular, like, you know, consumer facing brand? Well, I, I do think it's, it tends to be more conservative, I think. Mm. Um, and, um, you know, MIT has a voice and it has a persona that's been around for decades before, you know, I even got there, right? Um, and so I think the thing is, you have to be able to create a social media voice with a persona that's already built in, and 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 not not and not like I can change that. Um, voice and tone. I have to make it and translate it and um, into social media. So I think there's less room for me to, I mean, there's definitely no room for me to be snarky. Um, you know, I can be playful, but I have to make sure it's playful within the within our culture, like, you know, sort of the humor that I can play on is like um, with numbers, because our community no loves numbers, our community loves math jokes, any sort of puns I can play with number. So that makes sense. And that playful, that that works for us in the social space, but it's still part of our, our culture and our personality and, um, you know, and, and our audience can relate to it. It doesn't, it's not like its own thing. It's still it's still very much MIT. Um, oh, I love that. That's such a great example. I'm sorry. I just want to cut in because it's no. such a good example of like, uh, like math jokes, number yes. jokes, maybe data jokes are like so in line with it, it's, it's, it's smart humor, right? Literally it's, it's smart, right? It's, it's, it's about <laughs> numbers, it's about that. Um, it's core. It, it's, it, it is, it works for your audience. Right. And I think right. the other thing too, which, I think is probably a byproduct of finding the right kind of humor. The, the the happy byproduct is there can be no victims of this these kinds of jokes. Right. You know, right. they're just fun, playful, like maybe brain teaser things that they can still like you like there you can still take some levity to it, I think. But what I love is that it doesn't alienate anybody. Right. A hundred percent. And I, I, you know, I always say that um, there's nothing that bonds an audience more than when you laugh over the same thing because you think the same thing is funny, you know? Yeah. Um, and that really helps you to find your audience too. When, you know, when you kind of tell something that's playful or funny and they say, oh my gosh, this community gets me, MIT gets me, you know? Yeah. <laughs> um, and yeah. so that's, that's sort of how I feel like you build your community. Yeah. That's the other thing too, is it feels like MIT gets me. Like they, they feel seen. Right. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Because not, you know, not everyone gets a binary cooker, you know. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I wouldn't, but I'm still laughing. I know. I, I, <laughs> I, 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 I love learn. the idea of it. I, I, I just laugh at me saying that because I've had to learn and think in that space. But, you know, I wasn't always a numbers person, but I really have come to love numbers um, because I'm telling the story of them. Right. So yeah. you have to you have to embrace what you what you create. Yeah, totally. Um, so should we move on to our segment today? Yeah, if we're if we're okay. at that moment. We are at the moment. Okay. Um, I got my super cool graphic here. Wiser with whiskey. Woohoo. So in this <laughs> segment, <laughs> in this segment, Jenny and I are gonna talk about we are gonna do some whiskey tasting. We have yep. two different varieties here. And we are going to talk about um what we previously thought maybe about social media that we have since gotten wiser about. So social yeah. media takes with a whiskey spin, the things okay. that we've become wiser about. Um, okay. So we should take our our first yeah. one. So this is the, oh, oh you want to do let's that do the first? EY first. Yeah. Okay, perfect. All right. We have two kinds here. This is yeah. EY. EY, yeah. This is a very lovely Japanese whiskey. Um, I think you can buy, I mean, you can buy it at like BevMo if you're US based. Um, it's usually between like thirty-five and forty-five dollars, so it's not too expensive. 
Um, okay. Just kind of a nice, lovely little. Myself a... Yep. Just do a little Excite. bit because yep. it's really for me. Right. <laughs> <laughs> I I can't find my Glen Cairn glass. That's what I normally use for whiskey tasting. Yeah, I'm not um, even that like yeah. fancy. I just have a, a short. What do you call the um, a short? A low I think ball? those are low ball <laughs> or a little bit of high ball glasses. High ball. Yeah, I don't. Yeah. <laughs> I think it's just called a whiskey glass. It's a whiskey glass. Okay. Yeah. Okay. All right. I do. All right. Okay. Cheers. Cheers. Clink. Ooh, smell it first. I mean, it smells a little um, bright. Which yeah, I, tells me it's probably kind of notes. yeah. It tells me that it's probably kind of a um an, a, a younger whiskey. Uh, if, it, if it smells kind of um kind of bright like that, I was just googling UI. I just realized I should, you know, maybe tell some of our our viewers what uh, what to expect about this. So. According to Total Wine, this is from a distillery situated between the North and South Alps of Japan. Tasting notes are supposed to be sweet with fruit flavors like pear and quince. All right. So yeah. Jell and Joe are in the chat. I hope they're drinking too. Hi, Jell. Hi, Joe. Oh, okay. All right. I'm going to. Hmm. I definitely taste the pear. You, I, yes, you can surprisingly pick it up. I just think it's just so like, it's very smooth and it's lovely. It is. It yeah. doesn't smell like it would be that smooth, but it, but it, it goes down smooth for sure. Yeah. 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 I like it's that. So, it's so bright. Yeah. And you can't yeah. say that about a lot of, not a lot of whiskeys, I think. Mm -hmm. This is this is really nice. Yeah. Mm. All right. Oh, we got to do okay. a segment. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I was just going to say. Right. Are you ready to go first with your? Um, yeah, I'm happy to go you have, first. Something from yeah. social about social media that you have since wisened up over. Yeah. So, um, like, I would say about five years ago, even maybe maybe a little bit more, I would, I just didn't know why people were on LinkedIn. I was like, why are you even on? Why are you wasting your time with LinkedIn? Especially in the higher ed space. I was, would always say it's not a fit. You know, I mean, I would always kind of say, you never know where it's going to go, but it's just not a fit right now. But inside I'd be like, why is anyone wasting their time on this? But now I am bullish on LinkedIn. I just think that, um, particularly in higher ed, if I get to give this advice, I always tell people, if you're considering like between Facebook and LinkedIn and you want to do one, I I actually um, tell people to go lean toward LinkedIn. I lean toward mm -hmm. LinkedIn. It's just, I just feel like the algorithm feels more pure and, or, um, and transparent. And it just feels like a, a much more positive space. The, mm -hmm. um, people the audiences are really really engaged and we're just we're you know we're just seeing really really high engagement numbers on linkedin when we post mm -hmm. comparatively so i am bullish on linkedin right now so i'm yeah. eating my words from yeah from several <laughs> years ago yeah i love that i i it's so funny I, I mean i agree and it's just funny to me that like there are so many jokes about linkedin being cringe and i bake some of these jokes too i it, because I think you can believe both, right? I think sometimes there's yes, cringy totally. stuff. Totally, it's also yeah. every. It's also it's also everywhere. Yes. There's cringe yes. everywhere. But I agree with you. I mean, it is it is um, far better to be in terms of organic reach, especially compared to to Twitter or Facebook, um, because there's still more demand than there is supply for content. I LinkedIn. think yes, and you really mm -hmm. need original content or just share content that is really has good information, right? I love that that right. it's a space where they're really sharing information. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, cool. Uh, okay, so mine is something I've gotten wiser about. So, I guess mine is about Snapchat. I'm not mm. on. It's it's called Snapchat, right? The company is called Snap. But the app is still called Snapchat. Right? Yes, that is correct. <laughs> See, that yeah. goes to show like how out of touch I am with that. Uh, and I'm still <laughs> not really on it. Or yeah, I'm not on it. 
Um, but the thing that I will say is for a long time and even still now, I don't get it. It's just not my platform and that's fine. But what I have wisened up over is it is a place where there are some people who are making a ton of money, like ton. Mm -hmm. And by ton of money, I mean like five figures per week, ton of money. And they're doing things like giving marketing tips or like just general kind of B2B advice. Wow. Um, and I think I'm kind of fascinated by that because yeah. some of these people have ramped it pretty quickly. Like a friend told me that they have a friend and, you know, who spent the past year just making content on Snapchat about, uh, I think it was about marketing, you know, it's some kind of B2B content. And this person, I think pretty quickly, I think after several months, just months, has already gotten to the point of getting sponsorships and stuff and making like five figures a week. Really? <laughs> yeah, which is wild. I'm like, dang it, I was doing yeah. it wrong. I was on Twitter this whole time. <laughs> Yeah, no, I'm going to have to look into that a little bit more because I the thing with Snapchat is I just remember it not being very discoverable. It was hard to mm. find people or it was hard to find subjects, of, like certain subjects and topics. But um, mm -hmm. that's interesting. That's yeah. really interesting. Good yeah. take. Yeah. Um, are you done with your first class? Uh, yeah. It Well, okay. here, wait, maybe I can. Maybe I <laughs> so we can. Pound it. Pound okay. It. I, know. <laughs> I do have another glass. So. I know. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Thanks, Amanda. Thanks, Dan. <laughs> um, um, okay. So the, okay. our next one. So we have different ones. I wasn't able yeah. to get Monkey Shoulder. Yeah, um, so that's the one you have. Shoulder. So Monkey and... Shoulder is your favorite whiskey, right? Or one it's of your my, favorites? Yeah. It's the one that yeah. I'm currently enjoying. If I do like want to go buy a whiskey this one is the one that I tend to get so hmm. um I will and generally how much is that it like, I want to say range. it's right around yeah it, I think it's right around 30 dollars oh that's um, a good price point yeah, yeah. I think that it, it's not super um yeah it's about the same as the EYE mm -hmm. and nice the, okay and the one I have is I have an Aberlour 12 12 year mm -hmm. This is one yeah. of my go-tos. Like this is one of the ones that I just I always kind of have in stock at home. Okay. It's just one of my favorites. Um, and I think in terms of like a high-end kind of whiskey that is still relatively um, affordable is okay. this one. It's so Aberlour Twelve. It's still twelve years. It's a single malt, and it it costs between like fifty and sixty dollars okay. per per bottle, which mm. it's not cheap, but like. Yeah. You know, it's it's still more affordable than yeah. a lot of other kinds That's, of single malts. Yeah, I yeah. some I see, and I'm just like, oh, <laughs> that one I could take home with me. I think yes, very nice. yeah. And it's it's also like Im impressive to me. It's as a twelve year, it's still in that really affordable yeah. price I'm point. Have to, I just wrote it down, so I'm gonna have to try that one. Yeah, but we will. Right. How does yours smell? Oh, you see, a lot more of the malt comes through. I mean, it's oh. a malt, so yeah. yeah. But more of it, like that true, more of more of that true whiskey, like smell mm -hmm. comes through with this one. Okay, so I made a noob mistake here. I forgot to kind of rinse my glass from the EY, no. and I just poured this. So no, best I brought. I had two different glasses. Smart. I came. Smart. I came prepared. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Cheers. Yeah. Cheers. Um. Yeah. So compared, like the EYE is smoother, but I just, I like the clean, it's got a clean finish um, and mm -hmm. and the malt, I like, you know, the malt definitely comes through a lot. I don't know. Mm -hmm. I just enjoy this one. Yeah. <laughs> but I do Very like nice. the EYE too. I think I have mm -hmm. two new favorite, another new favorite. There's a brighterness to the EY that it, yeah. there's, so it, there's like a refreshing aspect to it. Mm -hmm. Like I think maybe with some like club soda on ice, like a like a nice Japanese highball, probably a really refreshing drink if yeah if you're inclined to prefer darker spirits, or if you're just trying them. If you're trying whiskey mm -hmm. for the first time, I would mm -hmm. say that that's a good entry whiskey. <laughs> maybe. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And the so Avalor, yeah, it's very good. It's uh, so it's really smooth. There's you know the maltiness, um, mm -hmm. almost notes of caramel 
which is really nice. And something else I'm tasting is like uh, subtle notes of vanilla. You have a really good palate, Amanda, picking up on vanilla. I just drink too much whiskey. I'm, <laughs> I'm over here going, yeah, it tastes like whiskey. It's yummy. <laughs> <laughs> But you're noting the smoothness. Yeah. <laughs> the malt. The maltiness the malt. comes through. Yeah. All right. Second take. Something you okay. are wiser about with social media. Okay. So um, I, same same time as like, like maybe several years ago, I was, was saying like, why does anyone need a website? Your social media channels or your website. It's, you know, mm -hmm. like websites are long and gone. Um, I do not feel that way anymore. <laughs> I, I think there is something about social media posts. There's like a solvency. They almost feel solvent sometimes. Um, and I think that you need you need a central location, not that everyone's going to visit your website every day, but it's good to have a space where you can sort of go back to and, and archive, you know, and really have a place where you people can learn everything about you and what if that's mm -hmm. what they're looking for. So, you know, your social posts might be the entry point to people learning about you. But if they want to like discover more about you, then I think a website is necessary. So I've definitely backed off of that. I think websites do have their place. Um, and, and, you know, they complement social media channel um, channels. Yeah. Yeah. I like that. And um, I also just think, well, I guess my, my point of view on this specific thing is is more personal because I've seen it on my personal social media, which is just that people who really care about you or are really interested in you, they will go to your website to learn more. Right. Um, I think people worry that people aren't going to click or like they won't click through, but, and, it, and absolutely the majority will not, but um you're going to have the really engaged people who do click through and they want to see what your company or what you are all about or, you know, the, what what they can learn from you or why you are an expert in whatever it is you say you're an expert. Yeah, in. I think it's I think it's really important, especially in the networking aspect of when I when I say to someone, gosh, yes, I do know someone. Um, and here's, you know, I, I usually post or give them their website link or I give them their LinkedIn, right, link. Um, so I think it's good to have a central place that um, mm -hmm. stores all of your, your, your stuff, <laughs> your, yeah. your experiences, yeah. your, yeah, exactly. Yeah. And, and there are also different ways to do this. And so, I mean, I think obviously if you are a company, then yeah, you probably have a website already, but it's good to optimize like certain, maybe the about page or something for, like very clearly explaining what what it is you do, right. um, but I think as for like individuals or for solo creators, uh, there's also value in just having like a what is it? I think it's called card with two R's, C A R R D, like a which is basically like a one page website where it's just maybe you just put like your headshot and like a little bit more about yourself. List. Like I think there. Yeah. yeah. Or maybe you list out like other links to things that you're passionate about or that you're interested in. I think those things are really valuable. I think because I, I honestly like I'll I will I will usually go to people's personal sites if they link to it on their on their social media. I will almost always do that because I always want to learn more. I'm like if, if I if I'm curious to follow someone and they have a personal right. site, I always I'll go to it to be like, oh, well, well, who is this person or like. They write about marketing, but 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 like but what do they say about learn it? Learn like, more. No, experience in it? yeah, totally, a hundred percent. And I think that's that's true for personal sites and 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 also just branded or organizational sites. Like honestly, I did think that you know why does why do why does higher ed why do schools even have um, a website anymore? Because students are not going to your website. They're you know they're searching you and they're looking at your social media um, accounts. Mm -hmm. But I've like I said, I've really backtracked from that because you know they might know you're on twitter but you know your 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 posts your twitter posts are so it's a, it's it's a it's they get lost in in the stream of just content and so i think there's there should be a place that they can go to, to see everything even if that yeah. student or that um for you know um, person that's looking for a job wants to know more about your culture or, um to go to for the first time it's a, it's important now so i've definitely 
I've mm-hmm. definitely changed my mind about that. Yeah. Okay. All right. My la- my last yeah. one and then yeah. we'll move on. Yeah. Uh, okay. Something I got wiser about. What is inspirational quotes used in social media? So now my opinion on them. Is, well, okay. My old opinion was they're super shareable. People love them. Got to post more of them because people really <laughs> like sharing this stuff. Great. That was my my old opinion on it. My wiser opinion is yes, but inspirational quotes are not as valuable. So they are sort of guarantees for engagement. Like people love them, but they're not valuable. And by, and by valuable, what I mean is if someone's following you for inspirational quotes, it doesn't mean that they respect you as a thought leader or you as um, for your original ideas. Because if you're posting original, if you're posting other quotes, you're not posting original ideas. And so therefore, what you are creating isn't really valuable so much as it is shareable. And there's a difference between valuable and shareable. Um, And I'm not saying it's bad or wrong to use inspirational quotes or it's not, it's just, I think that to win in social media, you have to be strategic about how you use them. So I don't think uh, unless for some reason, maybe maybe you want to create a, a book, maybe you want to publish a book, on inspirational quotes, maybe people will buy that. I don't, I mean, I don't know. Um, so maybe in that case, maybe it makes sense to have a social account that's only quotes. Um, yeah, but, but it's like to, it's like to what end, right? Like yeah, what is, yeah. is it, is it furthering your mission or goal or is it? Right. You know, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. It's that to what end, right? Mm-hmm. But if you are posting maybe about a certain subject or topic, your, um, maybe expertise or experiences in that and you supplement it with quotes, that's different, right? That's like you kind of adding um, color to the things that you're already doing. So hundred percent. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So what's the, if that word on it made sense. I like it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I like it. Uh, All right. We are about out of time. Um, Jenny, thank you for coming. Oh, Can it you- was so fun. Can you tell the people like where they should find you, where you want them to find you? Tell um, us things. Yeah, I mean, definitely. I think I'm at pretty, the most active on Twitter, so you can find me there at the Jenny Lee, um, J N N Y L I. Um, I also te- teach a cohort based class with a group of faculty members. It's the Digital Building um, Community Cohort with. Dr. Josie Alquist. Um, We just started a new session. Yeah, we just started a new session. So that's closed um, for registration, but just keep your eye on it in the future if you want to, um, you know, take a class about digital community and social media strategy and and we'll really get into the platforms, you know, if if that's something that is on your mind. Um, Is that that better for individuals or for brands? Um, I, you know, it's, I would, you know, we've always had people that were social media managers that were part of an organization, Um, Mm -hmm. but I could see it benefiting, you know, you personally as well, um, because we really kind of like dig into the strategies of each person. So, um, yeah. Yeah. Cool. I'll make sure to get a link, a link to that from you so I can drop it in the, in the description after we, after we go live. Um, Perfect. Cool. And... What else is there? All right, friends. I think that's kind of it. Um, yeah. <laughs> thank you for joining us for the menu. Thank you, Jenny. Thank you, um, Amanda. Yes. I will see you all next week, hopefully, next Friday at 11 a.m. Pacific time. Or you know what? Catch you later when you watch this uh, on your own time. <laughs> Ho- hopefully with a whiskey. <laughs> hopefully with a whiskey, with a with a little glass of EY or monkey shoulder or Aberlour 12. <laughs> Um, cool. All right. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. And thank you to our friends. Gotta say thank you to Jill, to Joe, and Beth, as always. Awesome to have you guys. Thank you for tuning in. Really appreciate you.